I would like to call to order the Winthrop School Committee meeting for Monday, September 9th, 2024. This meeting is being held in the Harvey Hearing Room at the Town Hall 1 Metcalf Square at 6 p.m. It is also available Zoom and will be broadcast live. May I have the roll call, please? Ms. Leonard? Yes. Mr. Letary? Yeah. Mr. Matucci? Ms. Petrie? Here. Mr. Purinton? Here. Ms. Barry? Ms. Powell? Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Leonard, can you lead us? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. We would like to have a moment of silence to honor the students of the Appalachian High School, the students and the teachers who, in their tragic event, Thank you. We have no public comment in the room. Do we have public comment on Zoom? We do not. Karen Chavez is on, but um, is the only person on right now. But I'm assuming we may she may be having some audio trouble because it keeps flashing. But I'll check in with her okay. and give her an opportunity. If, uh, Thank if you. We have no delegates and visitors tonight. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of August 19? 2024. Motion. Motion by Mr. Letiri. No, Mr. Purinton. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion by Mr. Purinton. Second. Second by Ms. Petrie. Any discussion? May I have a roll call, please? Ms. Leonard. Abstain. Mr. Letiri. Abstain. Ms. Petrie. Abstain. Mr. Purinton. Yes. Ms. Powell. Yes. I think we have to uh, make a, I think we, we should hold phone. these over until the next yeah. meeting. There's not a, not a quorum? No. Well, there's not a quorum only two of years. people that were here yeah. last time. Right. So we'll put one for the next agenda. Yes, okay. yes, please. May I have a uh, motion for warrant SVW 25-4 in the amount of $349,787.09? Motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Letiri, second by Ms. Leonard. Any discussion? May I have a roll call, please? Ms. Leonard? Yes. Mr. Letary? Yes. Ms. Petrie? Yes. Mr. Purinton? Yes. Ms. Powell? Yes. For buildings and grounds, we have a request for WinArc for the Special Olympics. And along with that, we are, um, they are asking for a motion to waive the rental fees. Motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Petrie, second by Ms. Leonard. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. And these I can take together. These are requests from the PTO for use of the William P. Gorman Fort Banks for an ice cream social, for their meeting dates, and for the trunk or treat. Motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Petrie, second by Mr. Purinton, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed or <coughs> abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. Uh, we have a request by the WHS PTC Club for their meeting dates. Motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Petrie, second by Ms. Leonard. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions or objections? Hearing none, motion passes. We have a motion from the, we have a request from the Winthrop Youth Football for their football leagues, football games. Motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Petrie, second by Mr. Purinton. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. Request from the Merrimack United FC, so FC soccer games for use of the facilities. Motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Petrie, second by Ms. Leonard. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions or objections? Hearing none, motion passes. 
a request from the Arthur T. Cummings PTO for their meeting dates. Motion. Motion by Ms. Petrie. Second. Second by Mr. Purinton. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. And finally, we have a request from the Commonwealth Clinical Services for use of the, for the Winthrop Community Health Forum. Motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Purinton, second by Ms. Petrie. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Hearing none, motion passes. We have no subcommittee reports tonight, but we do, I believe, have a superintendent's report. Yes, no, I ran upstairs to get it. Um, just a few things. Um, grants have started to come in, so our entitlement grants have started um, to roll in. We have to apply for those every year, even though they're only entitlement grants, and they have a window of opportunity um, for you to apply for those. So um, for our Title I grants, Laurie um, Galvin and Kathy Del Vento do a lot of work around those grants writing them, getting them into the Department of Education through the now not new GEM system, which is a little different than what we've used in the past. Um, and Jen O'Connell does the um, special education entitlement grants. So just for sort of a comparison, um, the majority of the entitlement grants that we get separate from what we receive from ESSER, the Early Childhood um, Special Education Program grant this year, uh, that grant is $24,576. That grant is $6 more this year than it was last year, which is, these are important things to kind of keep in the back of your head. The 240 grant, that's the um, IDA Special Education Entitlement Grant. That's the largest grant that we do receive in the districts. Again, separate and distinct from past ESSER grants. And that's based on special education numbers. Uh, this year, we received $651,623. That's an increase of $2,606 from last year. Then we get into um, the title grant. So Title I um, is the basic Title I grant. This year we received $387,204. And I can forward this to you all if you um, would like to see it. That's $6,921 less than what we got last year. Title II, which is um, Title IIA, Supporting Effective Instruction, um, that we use to pay for our mentor teachers. That's where that money comes from, to pay the mentors to work with our new teachers, which is a requirement to have a mentor for a teacher. This year, having upwards of 30 teachers new to the district, um, they all have to be assigned a mentor to work with them, and there are, there's a rubric and a timeline with what the mentors do with our new teachers. Um, and again, this year, we received 55120 which is $4,010 less than last year. Title III is the ELA Acquisition uh, and Academic Achievement Grant that we are entitled to apply for. This year, that grant, we received $40,517, which is about a $5,337 increase. And then Title IV, which is a uh, student support grant for academic enrichment. This year, we received $28,579, which is uh, $1,222 less than last year. So overall, those entitlement grants come in at $1,187,619. Uh, when you add them all up, that's $4,204 less than we received last year. Why is that um, important to know? One, because it's less money uh, coming to us from, from the state and federal government. Um, but for Winthrop, the context is 85% of our grants are salaries. So they fund salaries that are in existence. And if you think about that, when you think about year to year, whether a teacher gets a step increase or whether there's a percentage rate in a salary increase, if the salaries go up and the grants stay even, then we still have a problem. If the salaries go up and the grants go down, we have a bigger problem. Um, and just throwing in the SR3 funding that we received over uh, the past three years, we had some salaries in there, $500,000 worth of salaries over a three-year time frame. The SR3 grant is not an entitlement grant uh, any longer. So that was a limited grant uh, that we received $3 million and change over a three-year period of time. And those funds are no longer available to us. Those are gone. Um, are on the 30th? On the 30th. Well, they have to be exp fully expended by the 30th of, of this month, um, which means that there are no salaries paid out of ESSER 3 that go beyond September 24th of this month. Now, we budgeted for that um, and planned for that, 
Um, however, moving forward into FY26, um, you can see how that, that story uh, will continue to, to be frustrating for us because if next year if the grants go down again and the salaries by automatic because if one teacher goes up a step and they're in a grant, then their salary goes up. And if those grants keep coming in lower, um, we keep getting deeper and deeper in the hole. And that's the reliance on grants. Um, you know, they talk a lot about not embedding. Grants is supposed to supplement your instruction, supplement your support staff, meaning give you more than, than your own community can fund. That's what they're designed to do. Um, surplanting is a term that's used for reliance on those grants to have people that you can't do without. And Winthrop is not um, the only district in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that has now turned into the school of supplant, um, but it's out of desperation that we have to do that. Um, so the reading specialists, the reading teachers, the EL teachers, the nurse, um, multitude of, of staff salaries, we have custodians uh, in, that we had in Esser, um, all of those, all of that money, as it gets smaller and smaller and the cost gets larger and larger, um, we start to run into a wall of not being able to fund those things. Um, so as we were looking towards FY26, knowing that the ESSER funds were going down our way, um, we projected for that. The state and its wisdom, when they give more money on one end with Chapter 70, they take it from somewhere else. And so I don't think folks anticipated these grants dropping uh, as much as they have. For us, as a $4,000 4, loss is pretty big compared to the fact that we actually need way more money than that to fund those same people year to year. Um, so hopefully those grants will not continue uh, to go down. We have not seen any new entitlement grants. I keep hoping every day when I pop on the Department of Education's website that they're gonna say, hey, for all you people uh, that are suffering um, because learning loss and the impacts of, of COVID um, are still here <laughs> and the money from SR3 that was provided to communities to help um, mitigate some of the issues that were uh, caused by learning loss. Um, that money's gone, but the issues are still here. And I think all of us in the field of education have said from, you know, from the jump that that's wonderful that we're getting money for three years, but who made that rule? That this, that COVID was only gonna impact student learning and, and um, learning loss and recovery of learning and the social emotional impacts of of you know, what happened in our world, who made the rule that that was only gonna last three years? The person who created the funding made that rule. Um, so the impacts are still here and the money is not, but I think it's important to understand that in terms of our grant funding. We are always seeking grants. We are very mindful, you have two seasoned grant writers and three with Kathy, um, that grants are wonderful, but you have to weigh what you put into the management and the time in receiving a grant and what they want back from you once you get that grant. The amount of work involved uh, sometimes outweighs you know, the $20 that you receive because you have to have somebody managing those. And you have some people that are wearing 450 hats in the management field here. Um, so, but we're constantly looking for them. Yeah, so a little update on that. A Couple of um, things we still have to fill, I'll get into that when we get into uh, build um, personnel, but Charlie passes, I heard um, there was some information at one of the town council meetings about Charlie passes and access to Charlie passes. Um, the school district has had Charlie passes for, I can tell you, for at least seven years. Um, we reach out to the MBTA every year after August 15th and ask them for MBAT, MBTA uh, Charlie passes. And what they are is their cards uh, that are provided to the school for the, to be able to give to students who need them and the students load them um, with funds, but it's at a discounted rate for them to be able to ride um, the buses to and from uh, school if they want, Monday through Friday. So we get f we order 500 a year, and we use approximately 400 of those, but then kids lose them, so we have extras. We have to keep track of them, to report it to the MBTA. So those are all in, um, primarily for students um, in grades 6 through 12, because they're the ones who need the pass to get on uh, onto the bus. I believe other kids can ride with an adult for free students under a certain age. Um, the secretaries at the buildings know how to handle those, so they get those out to the students, and the students are notified um, that they are there and ready for them. And the kids do a pretty good job of, of gathering those up. 
school bus service for those students who live beyond two miles, so the students who live primarily down the point. Um, I now know every street down the point uh, and where they are. Um, we had a number of riders this year. I believe we had 56 children between the uh, grades of kindergarten and sixth grade, which are the students who are um, eligible for bus service from the town. So this criteria, you have to live 2.1 miles or beyond is the actual definition from the door of the school which you attend. And we use a, a very specific Google mapping system. Um, and you have to be in grades kindergarten through sixth. If you're in seventh grade, you're not entitled. Eighth grade, you're not entitled. Um, so we do a, a reach out every summer to those families. We go through our um, student information system, which had flipped over this year so to, to uh, power schools. So that was a little bit of a trick for us, getting all those uh, streets and names and querying that. And then we get all the students, and then we do a reach out to the parents to let them know that the bus service is going to be available. Our, our issue is we don't have a bus. We have vans, and we have one driver. So we really work hard to make sure that anybody who um, is entitled to transportation gets back to us and lets us know Monday through Friday, are you taking it to school? Are you also taking it home? If you're only taking it on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then we map the whole thing out so that we can maximize, um, one, the traffic, not sending multiple vehicles to the schools, but also uh, making sure that uh, the bus that we have has enough space to fit the students on it. So as of Last week, we narrowed it down. Skip Cali is a retired um, custodian and a bus driver extraordinaire. Um, he's wonderful with the kids. We have, uh, he drives a van that holds 11 students, but we also have a 14 passenger um, that we could swap out if need be. He has a monitor on the, ba on the van. We talk about multiple hats. The monitor is actually a lunch worker who jumps on the van before she starts her um, day at the middle school and then at the end of the day Skip picks her up and she does the afternoon run. So he'll be doing one run to the Gorman Fort Banks from the point in the morning and then pick those students up in the afternoon and bring them back and then same at the coming. So he'll pick the kids up at the point at the PSA hall, drop them off at the fort, go back, pick up the third, fourth, fifth and one sixth grader, bring them to the Cummings and to the um, middle school and then he'll sit back for a little bit and he'll do it all again in the afternoon. Kindergarten students are gonna stay um, in the building because they dismiss earlier than first and second. So they'll stay and do a 20 minute wrap around um, with FKO in the same area that FKO is in, but we'll have an instructional aid in there monitoring. Some of the key things our students that we require is they, when they get off the bus, when Skip brings them to the fort or to the um, coming school, they have to go right directly inside the building and into the cafeteria. Supervision is huge. We take attendance on the vehicle. When the kids get on, we actually circle the vehicle and take attendance, making sure there's no one left on the vehicle. And we do that at the end of the day. Um, it's not the bus driver's response. The bus driver's responsibility is to take attendance of the kids when they're in his custody. And then when he releases them into the school, they become the custody of the school. So some folks want kids to be able to stay outside and play. That's just not possible in terms of our being able to monitor whether the students have entered the school. So if you, if you think about students who would get off the bus and go play and they've never entered into the school, then if they left the play area and decided they were gonna go to somebody's house for the rest of the day or go hang out in the park, we would not know that they got off that bus or that they weren't in school because the parents think they got to school. So if the parent puts a child on a bus um, then you can be guaranteed that they're expected to be at school. If your child doesn't get on the bus, it's, still, it's the parent's responsibility to call the school and, and let the school know that the student is absent. We provide the parents with guidelines, we provide them with instruction, we provide them with sign-offs so that they do, um, they're very much aware of the rules. Um, so we're excited to start that on Wednesday. Um, Skip communicates with all the parents, he has everybody's name, telephone number, who needs to be dropped off to an adult. K1 and 2 cannot get off the bus in the afternoon and if there is not an adult there to receive them. Third, fourth, and fifth May uh, and sixth, but not K1 and 2. So if that should happen, the student would be brought back to the school and those parents would be called by the principal of the school to come and retrieve the child. So that's just a sort of normal bus route. Cross your fingers for Wednesday, we'll see how it goes. Um, then just a few little things. Uh, data meetings happening and CPT, math CPT meetings and curriculum meetings and the diagnostic assessment schedule for 
Um, the month of September for math is underway at the Gorman Fort Bank School. Um, they have their schedules. We get to review them, Laurie and I, to s make sure that we're in compliance with getting that data early on. The PTO is sponsoring an ice cream social there on Friday, September 13th. Um, the details are all over the Gorman Fort Bank's website, and the PTO is um, amazing in terms of their outreach. So the kids are looking forward to that. After school enrichment is being scheduled now at the Arthur T. Cummings. Parents have been being notified. Um, some of the offerings are gym, kindness club, a drama club, chorus club, Lego club, um, and social emotional learning club. So the kids seem to be excited about that. Parents um, have been pretty reactive in sending in their, their slips and um, making sure that the students are, are getting registered. Back to school night. On the 12th at the um, middle school, and that's from 6 to 8, Mr. Curley has been jetting that out all over the place. Um, and just a quick update on enrollment. I have nothing on athletics um, or clubs as of yet. This is really the first full week of school coming up now, so we'll get more into that as we move forward. Um, and, but I do have an update on enrollment, as I did last uh, meeting. We're up to 2,008 students. Wow. The highest number since I've been here. Um, so, that being said, um, we, have, uh, we have some work to do on the re-registration um, in grades 3, 6, and 9. So we have some folks that have not successfully completed that. So as usual and customary, we've reached out to those parents beginning this week to let them know that if they did not do the re-established residency, um, that they have to do it now. They can make an appointment to see us. They can do it online. Um, but the deadline for that is September 16th. Um, and if they cannot prove their residency by September 16th, then there's a host of things that happen. We let them know that we're not gonna allow, be, we're not gonna allow the student to remain enrolled. However, we then need to have conversations with individual families before just pulling the rug out from underneath the student. But that's just one of the, la the layers of our um, residency process. We think, after speaking with principals, that some of it, um, a lot of parents, First, they said it was a language issue. I can tell you it's not, <laughs> because we put it out in multiple languages. If there is a language we missed, I would agree with that. Um, but the notices that go to the parents about what they need to do for registration um, is based on how they're regist how they are uh, enrolled already. So if they need things translated, they get those things translated. And we've had people here all summer. But we did find out where there are a number of families that leave the country for the summer, and so. They're just getting, some of those students are just returning, and they're just getting to emails. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working on that. So that number may go up or down uh, a little bit, but um, I don't think it's gonna change dramatically. And I think that is it for me for today. Okay. Homeschool applications, do we have some? We do. Uh, last time, I think I told you we had three. We are now up to 11. Um, most, they're all returning homeschoolers from the past few years. Um, we have one in first, one in second, one in fourth, one in fifth, two in sixth, one in seventh, and one in tenth. And then I have a couple other um, applications still out that haven't completed yet from a couple of the families that were on. And I'm still waiting for some information from some of the families who said, yes, we are intending to homeschool. At the end of the year, when I reach out for the progress report and updates, I ask them for their intent. Their intent. And so I guess it gives them a little time to get more of the paperwork started again because everybody kind of shuts down in the summer. So um, I expect that I'll see more of them coming in over the next week or so. So we need approval for 11 tonight? We need approval for eight. For eight. Have 11 total. Those grades that I just said to you. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the homeschool applications that have been filed? Motion. Motion by Mr. Parenton. Second. Second by Ms. Leonard. Any discussion? I just want to verify that you have verified all of those and yes, yeah, they're all they're, they're families that have been homeschooling um, since the beginning of COVID, and I think they've found something that really works for them, and um, and it's been very positive for a lot of the families and their experiences. So they've gotten really good at what it is that we need for progress reports and keeping me in the loop, and um, they've been nice nice families to work with. Okay, great. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any. Abstentions or opposition? Hearing none, motion passes. Personnel. Yes, so these run a little bit behind. So when you get these agendas, 
I, I look at them like they're a couple of weeks old, even though they're really not they're a, a week old. However, um, thankfully, we, we fill most of the positions before you even get them. So the resignations, um, we had two ESPs resign and one special education teacher, and that was actually either two or three days before school opened, which is not ideal, or within the last couple of days. Um, so you can see the postings that we have. A speech language pathologist is one of the postings. I believe we filled that today, thankfully. Food service workers, we're always looking for food service workers. You can go on our website and check that out. Um, and that particular position is at the Gorman Fort Banks. We have um, an ESP at the middle school position that um, is still open. They have you know, active applicants, but it's still open for another day or two, so if people are interested in that. The special education teacher position is a long-term sub-position for maternity leave. And the custodian position that you see is also a leave of absence for a medical issue. Um, and those, I believe, are all that we have right now. We still have an open, um, we have, it's been posted before, so that's why you, you don't see it here. We still have a position open for STEM at the middle school. Right now we have um, Rosemary McCarthy, who's the retired STEM teacher. Um, she is back and we have a long-term sub in there, when I say long-term, meaning until we can fill the position. Um, and that particular person is teaching and, and uh, Rosemary McCarthy comes in three days a week or two days, I'm not really sure, three, three, three days a week and works with the uh, person who's doing the substituting, working, getting the curriculum in place and making sure that um, we're up and running and that, that teacher that we have in there now, the temporary teacher is able to uh, move forward with the curriculum and that the kids' Chromebooks are working and that they're tied to the platforms they need to be tied to. We had, um, we did have a teacher, we did hire a STEM teacher who then saw a science job opening, um, which is really where that person wanted to be, but wanted to get their foot in the door. Um, and it was hard to, hard to pass up a certified science teacher uh, position and leave that open um, it's hard to leave either one of them open. Uh, but uh, the applicant pool for STEM teachers, um, Brian is a little frustrated with. Um, so we're working to see how creative we can be. I don't know how long we can hang on to Rosemary McCarthy. Uh, not long, but um, he said he, Brian told us today that he has, I believe he had an applicant that he was gonna yep. be interviewing. So we're hopeful for that. We have a couple of ESP positions open. We have a lot of maternity leaves um, coming up. I happen to own one of them, not me, it's not me. <laughs> Um, but my daughter will be having a baby in January. Um, and there's a few more folks um, that are um, having kids, which is amazing. Um, and thankfully, they're telling us early enough that we can start the process of looking for uh, folks to cover those. Um, we have a lot of great ESPs who have bachelor's degrees, um, many of whom are working towards attaining a teaching degree. Uh, work, we work with Salem State as well. Um, with their fellows to see if we can get folks to come in and do their hours. So um, sometimes people say, oh, well, you're going to have an ESP cover the class. That's not really a teacher. Some of our ESPs have been here long enough <laughs> that they, they are uh, pretty well schooled. And when our teachers do go out, they leave very, very detailed lesson plans. And I think it's also important to know that the teams that they teach in, whether it's the third grade team, the fourth grade team, they swarm over whoever it is that's covering for another teacher. Um, to make sure that that teacher has everything they need. Support in the classroom, uh, access to learning platforms, making sure that they understand the curriculum, materials and supplies that they may need, suggestions for how to do the lesson, help with correcting things and breaking down um, you know, the data and understanding what's happening within the classroom. So we've been very fortunate there. Um, so I just thought that was just a little better understanding of sometimes what happens when we, when we have to have uh, people who technically may not be certified, mm -hmm. um, but we are also seeing a lot of our ESPs take that next step, which is really good. Excellent. <coughs> Quick question. Yes. So overall on staffing, you, you, we're in a pretty good position. Yeah. Um, class size, how is that? Looking? Yep, so class size, I didn't bring it with me. I think I brought it the last meeting. I'll, I'll bring a real clear understanding, but low 20s, you know, 22. <coughs> um, it depends upon the class, the individual class, so I can mm -hmm. give you a, a, an idea of it. Um, so if you take kindergarten, for instance, right now uh, we have a number of 162. There's seven, every class is seven, elementary has seven teachers. 162 kids in K, 140 in first. Um, so low 20s, you know, 20, between 20 and 23. 
um, and that's with seven teachers. It, it's just amazing how quickly that can change with an influx of kids or a decrease in teachers for whatever reason, right? I mean, you can see those numbers go from the low yeah. 20s to the high 20s in a blink of an eye. If so, yeah, so third grade, um, it has 166 kids in it this year. And of the 166, there's 34. Oh, oh that's more. 32. Third, 32 plus. I think it's thirty. I think it's thirty-two, and then there's thirty. Thirty-two um, ML students, first mm -hmm. language, yeah. not English. So, and that's a that's a large group. So, larger class size, mm -hmm. and then you add. You know, when you, we when we do when we look at a class, there's all kinds of data points that you can look at. You could have a class size of 118, and if that class size of 118 has the largest amount of special education ML students, and that the class size itself is super important. But it's you have to know what you're, mm. what you're looking at in ter terms of the confines of the classroom and what one teacher in a classroom is doing with multitasking, you know, with differentiating instruction for multiple groups of kids. Third grade right now is our largest elementary um, classroom at 166. Um, next largest is uh, 163 at the fifth grade. Um, but yeah, you you take that number and divide it by seven, and then take that number and divide it by six if you cut one teacher and you take that number and you divide it by five if you cut yeah, two teachers and, and you're talking jumping from you know 23 to 28 to 33 i mean that's how it goes up and i've just made those numbers up right, but that's, but that's pretty, it is pretty, pretty substantial small, yeah. i just wanted to make sure i heard you correctly for some reason i thought we had gone to six teachers for one of the grade levels is that not true no so seven first first and second grade we had eight teachers last year oh. so right. first and second grade last year and through COVID, so with that Thanks. mitigation money to mm -hmm. mitigate learning loss, those were our most vulnerable learners, sure. you know, in, in K-1 and 2 because they were learn, had been learning through screens. So the first year of COVID, we added an additional, and we had, we had a bubble year, in a kindergarten bubble. I think we had 157 kids in kindergarten the year, um, the year COVID hit. Mm -hmm. So that bubbled up to first and second grade. So we added with ESSER three money an additional first and second grade teacher. Okay. And that lasted for those three school years. At the end of last school year, when the, we knew the money obviously was running out and we level service budget was gonna be less than level service, we had to look at how to, where, we were gonna, where we were gonna go. Mm -hmm. And so the numbers were less in terms of the class size numbers in one and two. Mm -hmm. But ironically, we also had a, a teacher retire in first grade and a teacher resign in second grade. So although we didn't fill those positions, they're gone. Mm, so it is a cut. So when even if people retire, if you don't put their position, a person back in that position, and you don't pay for it, or because you can't pay for it, it's a cut from your year before, from the service you provided the year before. So as of um, this school year, there are seven academic classroom teachers in K through, uh, K through five. In K through five. K through five, <laughs> six, seven, and eight. Um, there's, there's seven in, in grade six, and I think grade seven has eight. I'll bring it to the next meeting. Okay, I had it yeah. with me two meetings ago. Um, and those were because of, uh, again, because of bubbles in students. Um, but. The, the, the less number of teachers you have, the larger your class size absolutely will be. And it, it's pretty dramatic, and people think, wow, you, you know, seven teachers, okay, so you lose one. You're talking, okay, now you gotta spread 23 kids out in between six other people, mm -hmm. you know, and 23 kids with varying, varying needs. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you think about a teacher in kindergarten, even though there's, a, there's an aide in each kindergarten classroom, there's one teacher and one aide to 20. This year it's, it's 162 divided 20. by it's 20, like tw kids. 20, 20 kids per class okay. that um, have abilities that are a, a, a spectrum of abilities that are the length of the room. Some know how to go to the bathroom on their own. Some don't. Some can walk in a hallway by themselves. Some can't. Some, a milk container. <laughs> some, some can butter a bagel. Some can't. Some can walk in a line. Some can't. Some can speak English, some have no idea what you're saying to them and they have a bellyache and they need to see the nurse. Um, so two people in a room with 20 kids is even, you know, that in and of itself. Two kids have to go to the bathroom, we're in trouble. Um, if we go up in class size and down in staff, that's gonna be a significant concern. 
Mm -hmm. so those 157 are now, well, it's, it's probably a larger number now, and they're in what, second grade? Um, so right now we have those kids that were in kindergarten that are now in third grade, grade right? Third grade, it's one, stayed at 166. Okay. So those K kids, kids are, in, are now in third grade. And you have how many teachers in the third grade? Seven. Seven, Seven. Seven yeah. Okay. They're at 20, they're 23.3. And there's no there's there. no as far as instructional aids are concerned in the in Winthrop Public Schools, there are only seven instructional aids that are not tied to IEPs. Any other instructional aid in the entire school district is a mandated special education or 504 um, student support. Um, that's that's in a contract known as either an IEP or a 504 plan or a health care plan. And I, I think it's important to know too, the sig we've seen a significant increase in health care needs of children in our school systems. And when I say health care needs, I'm, I'm talking about huge jump in diabetics, students with diabetes, um, huge jump in medically fragile kids. We have, we have students who have feeding tubes, we have students who have tra trachs that need to be cleaned out and monitored throughout the school day. Um, we have students with severe airborne nut allergies. Um, and all of that requires health care plans. And we have one nurse per, per school. And on average, at the elementary school, we have close to 500 kids in a school. If you think about that, one nurse, 500 kids. Two adjustment counselors, 500 kids. So there's not a lot of fluff and peanut butter hanging out in the Winter Public Schools when we're talking about, you know, uh, you want to talk about the override, or you want to talk about just funding in general, you talk about grants being reduced. Um, there's there's not a lot to cut, or there's nothing to cut without a significant impact. Right. Can I just ask another quick question about those grant reductions? When did you find out at, about the essentially four thousand dollar? So those the amount. grants come in. Grants come in. The numbers come July, out usually the end of July, thirtieth yeah. okay. of July. So okay. yeah, it's the timing so it's is not late. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's the really timing late. is not right. So you have the to essentially budget done. for the year without right. Yeah. Okay. And so if you remember the nine C reductions, in, I think it was two thousand and three. I was traumatized mm -hmm. by it when the when the the government gave you you know you had all these different grants and all of a sudden in November or December mm -hmm. those grants that were in your coffers got wiped out. Mm -hmm. And so those are also you know, the risks of a changing economy. Mm. Um, and that's why they tell you it's a, sub, you, it's supposed, grants are supposed to be supplementary right, right. versus surplanting. But so like Lisa was saying, for us to have lost 6,000 in Title I and 4,000 in Title II, $10,000 is a big chunk for us because when you pay a grant and you pay a salary, you also pay their MTRS mm. contributions out, out of the grant. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> of Title I, 387,000 that you said, Twenty, yeah, 50, 360 something is 50,000 in MTRS money. But 60,000, I mean 360 of that 387,000 salaries. salaries in MTRS. So if that grant goes away, money. those positions automatically, what, if it goes away on a Tuesday, right. the positions go on a Tuesday because there's no funding source for them. And the other thing is that 6,000 turns into 12 when you're talking about reduction and then you're talking about an increase oh, yeah. in step or lane or whatever. Oh, so yeah. to, so, you know, to supplement and we, you that. Know, we have been very fortunate that we have been able to balance that over the past several years. And you know, COVID gave us a lot of things that we didn't like, but they did give us money at a point in time where the town of Winthrop was not gonna survive with the budget we had. Mm -hmm. Like I've said it 100 times, I would have been before the town council four years ago asking for an override if we didn't have the mitigation money f from COVID. And, and it helped us. It helped us get to where we are. Now is, is the impact bigger? It is, but I, you know, I'm not a betting person. I probably still have my communion money, but uh, I would not think that folks would have been up for an override during a global pandemic when people weren't working. And I think it would have been disingenuous to ask for money when you had money, albeit it was temporary money. And now we're at the point where the temporary money is gone. It wasn't a trick. We didn't think we had, we didn't hide money from people. The community actually told us how to spend that money based on the way we had to have that grant in for the COVID money. Right. You know? So <clears throat> thank you. Any other questions? Um, public relations. Yes. Patty, put it over here. And I'm going to read it. 
Um, obviously, the opening of school is public relation. I think we did a wonderful job. Um, traffic's always going to be uh, an issue. We're watching the Gorman Fort Banks traffic, uh, working with the police and fire department. More to come on that after we do our analysis of the opening and um, the minor change in 10 minutes of time that we uh, put in place for the sole purpose of getting common planning time and teacher schedules in, in a set in a fashion that we could uh, do more with the limited time we have, um, and also our thoughts on, on traffic. So more to come on that. Uh, senior Nick Capuccio has been selected to the Boston Globe Herald preseason Eastern Mass All-Star team. I think that was a couple of weeks ago, um, but kudos to him. He just keeps uh, racking up the awards. Lots of fundraisers happening. Class of 2026 is selling Viking blankets. You can call Kristen Bonapani at 617-290-3752 or look at the um, high school website or Facebook. Um, ATC is, um, no, the annual PTC calendar fundraise is also in effect. They have $10 raffle chances for prizes, um, and um, that's on the website as well. And then on Wednesday, October 9th, the annual walk, bike, or roll to school is being scheduled. I approved the flyer today um, so for the PTA, so you should see that coming home uh, for elementary schools, and that's a, a nice way to, to get to school and avoid the construction, the traffic. <laughs> And everything else so uh, but folks uh, lots of really good feedback I keep my fingers crossed I know I would um, I oh I keep losing connection I apologize but and I apologize for losing connection Laurie just told me we looks like we lost, lost connection, lost on, the connection zoom. on zoom we've been struggling a little bit with zoom and I don't know if it's the internet yeah. or if it's the system itself I think it's the internet a little bit it's yeah pretty pretty difficult. everywhere well, today was really slow I've been working on it so and that's um that's all I have Okay, any other public relations? Hearing none. Welcome back to the students and the teachers. We are thrilled to be starting a new school year. Very excited, and I've heard a lot of good things so far yeah. from parents. Um, motion to adjourn, please. Motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Letiri, second by Ms. Petrie. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions or opposition? Hearing none, motion passes, we are adjourned.